All right, we're here with Mentor Session. Uh, my name is Cesar Quintero. I'm the founder owner of The Profit Recipe. Uh, we're the largest EOS firm here in South Florida and Miami. And I'm here to help out with uh, Mentor Session. So that's what I'm doing here today. Um, I got my questions here, so let me, let's get started. Um, Bobby Pedasa, uh, his question is, how do I get more focused on fewer things that will actually get me better results? Uh, bis, uh, brief description is he's a general contractor, does some property rentals as an investor. He's looking to bring a mezcal brand to the U.S. I have a lot of going on on the day to day on the GC side. I'm not super organized and not great with computers. Um, uh, files, I know there's a better way to do this. Uh, Sean is your business coach now helping and looking on how to focus better in life. So. There's a book I just read. I loved it. Uh, Dan Sullivan uh, wrote a book called 10X is Easier Than 2X. 10X is Easier Than 2X. And the reality is that focus is what drives uh, you faster where you need to go. So one of the things I loved about this book is when you, you know, it, and, and I tell my clients all the time, when, you're, when you think about too many priorities, they stop being a priority, right? Priority originally was an English word and there's no plural for priority, the Americans created the priorities because we need to add a lot of shit and a lot of stuff into our into our place. So I want to make sure that we all understand focus is power, right? If you think about the sun, you know, Al Rise says you know, when, when the sun, the power, the energy of the sun, but it's scattered throughout the universe, right? So what we get here is heat. We get, you know, sunburn. We get a little bit of that. Um, but... If you compare the, the power of the sun with the power of a laser, a laser beam is much more focused, much more specific. It'll pierce right through you even though it doesn't have as much energy as the sun. So we don't have unlimited time of energy. So be careful as an entrepreneur where you spend your time in. And one cannot have their butts in two different toilets. Now, I've been a person that's always had more than one company. And at the beginning, that was at, to a detriment to mine. I realized that then I needed operational partners in each of the businesses. And the only way to have my butt in different seats is to have different people that can create that structure for me and operate those things for me. So now I currently have two businesses, have two operating partners. I'm there and I, we have a cadence and I can focus my time specifically to each business where I need to. But Bobby, if you're in startup mode, if, you're, if you haven't scaled yet, Focus on one thing and do it right. Do it full, put all your energy, your time, and mind to that so that it can really go to where you need it to go, all right? So I think it, it depends on where you are in your cycle and in your in your flywheel. Um, but right now, if you're in startup mode, if you're starting off, if, if, if contracting is needing all of your time, focus your time in creating a independent company that does not depend on your time and energy, and then once you do, you can go out and spend your energy in something else. All right. Hope this helps. All right. I'll go to Carl Clark. Uh, the question is, how often should I be meeting with my team to keep great company culture and prevent any team conflicts? Um, I have a residential and commercial cleaning company in New Jersey. There are people. There are eight people. Um, we do not have an office and we do not do full team meetings. We use texting and communication. And I speak with our team daily as I get out there and work with them side by side. We do well, but I want to level up and grow this company. Okay, so Carl, when when you're thinking about scaling your company and, and scaling culture, because that's what you're doing, you're scaling trust, you're scaling culture. The important thing is, um, I, I come from the EOS philosophy, so the entrepreneur operating philosophy. When you're, when you're thinking about the meeting rhythms and the meeting pulse, um, there should be three main meetings that need to happen with each individual, right? So the first one is a company address. You bring the whole company together, and every quarter you're reminding them of the vision, of the culture, where we're going, what are the goals, what are the things that happened that didn't happen, right? So at least once a quarter we're having an all-team meeting where everybody's reminding on where we're going, why we're doing this, where we are, and what we need to do to get there. All right. So that quarterly company address, try to have it all in person if possible or everybody together. Um, that's that's one. Right. Then on a weekly basis, you want to be having a meeting 
of making sure that we are headed on track and our focus is intact and we remove roadblocks. So on a quarterly basis, you're making sure that everybody's aligned to the vision. On a weekly basis, you're making sure that everybody's removing roadblocks and solving issues so that we can get to where we need to get to on a weekly basis. On a weekly basis, you can have them in teams. So if you have a leadership team, if you have teams that are implementing uh, or, or a cleaning team or different teams can get together once a week and they can solve problems as a team, right? And then lastly, so usually that quarterly meeting lasts about an hour. The weekly meeting lasts about 90 minutes, an hour of whatever you need to do, depending on the size of the team. And then on a daily basis, I love having daily huddles. Daily huddles are tactical. Are what are the, it's three questions. What did I do last week? What did I do yesterday that I want to celebrate? What is my main priority for today? And where am I blocked? Where, where, what do I need to solve? And it's a five to 10 minute meeting, everybody together at the beginning of the day where we're just celebrating yesterday, refocusing for today, and then asking any questions, any, any support that you need. So when you, when you have these meetings, you always add some culture, you add some alignment, and you add some vision. Uh, by text, it's great to have a text channel that can promote culture, do culture shout outs, core value shout outs, vision shout outs, stories of customers, stories of different things. So through text, it's always good to check in and give kudos and different things around it and bring your culture to life. But it's really important to be intentional about the time you spend together and what each purpose of those is. So on a quarterly basis, making sure everybody's aligned and following towards a vision. On a weekly basis, making sure that people are solving problems together. And then on a daily basis, you get into a tactical, what was good yesterday, what do we need to do today, and how do we, um, how do I remove roadblocks for today? So I hope this helps, but that's usually the meeting cadence that you want to have in any type of company, any scale, at any, any growth rate. All right? All right. Our next person is Madeline uh, Ugbobo. Um, how do I start figuring out what would be my best first company? This is an interesting question. I know this is a tough question to answer, so maybe you could help me by explaining how you found your calling and built your company. How did you know the company uh, I should start? I come from a very low income background. I have been in and out uh, of two very abusive relationships and I'm now getting the confidence to build your next chapter in life. Congratulations, that's what I love to hear. I'm a good speaker and a good trainer of medical assistants and I'm hard worker. How do I take my training experience and good communication skills and fill out and find out what business would be great for you? All right, I love this, I love this. Um, two different things I wanna to talk to you about here. Madeline, first congratulations for going over these things and, and looking forward and, and getting into it, right? Um, I personally got into entrepreneurship for the wrong reason. I saw a gap in the market, I thought I could fill it, and I didn't even ask myself is that something I wanted to do or I did, I'd like to doing or not. So I did it the wrong way. I, I think I went into something where I saw a gap and I'm like, I can fill this gap and there's an area for opportunity, for profit, so why not do it? And that's my first business, I started that. It took me seven years to get to a million dollars. After 10 years, I was really frustrated and created a big burnout for me. I eventually ended up selling that company 16 years after when I shifted and repivoted a lot of my uh, purpose and, and how I wanted to show up. It took me 16 years to determine on what I wanted to be when I grew up, what I wanted to do and all these things. And I know a lot of times people are like, well, you first have to go through the grueling process of going into it and doing all these things. But the reality is that there's a concept called the Ikigai, which I love which Ikigai starts with purpose. What do I love to do? What am I great at, right? No, I'm sorry, what do I love to do? So it's purpose-driven, it's things that you love to do and things that make you get out of the bed in the morning and feel happy, right? Then you go into what are you good at? You're saying you're good at communication, you're good at um, training uh, medical assistants. So what am I good at? What, am I, what are the things that I excel at and, and understand your strengths? Then third, what can I make money on, right? Because I can be great at singing, which I'm not, but I could be great at singing, but I, you know, not many people can make a living out of singing. So how do I how do I find something that is a purpose purpose filled? Then second, something that I'm good at. Then third, that I can make money. And then fourth, that's impactful for the world. It's something that can help you impact your community, impact your 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 world, and impact the way they do. So if you find something that matches all those four, that's a perfect ikigai situation where you're gonna put all your energy and your thought and that's what 
triggers flow is what they call it, right? So that's number one. That's the philosophical answer to your question. Now, the practical answer to your question is, if you feel you're good at these things and there's opportunities for you to start developing and start testing different things that you can um, uh, sell in your market, um, there's a book by Gino Wickman called Leap, and it's the Entrepreneurial Leap. In that book, they have an assessment that you can take, and based on the assessment, it tells you what type of business are you best suited for. There's people that are better geared for franchising. There's people that are better geared for consulting. There's people that are better geared for creating a service businesses or a product business. So there's an assessment that helps you, ask you the right questions that get you into these things. So practical tools could be go into something. Um, there's a um, leap, Gino Whitman, uh, the entrepreneurial leap. You can go there. Um, also, try to find different ways that you can start doing minimum viable products. There's a book called Lean Startup that I love. Uh, it teaches you just try different things and just see what hooks and what creates market fit so that you can get there and then just go into that. So two books to recommend, um, Entrepreneurial Leap by Gino Wickman and, um, and then um, what's the other one? Uh, Lean Startup which talks about minimum viable product and how to test different things. All right. Sorry, Facebook is giving me different messages. I'm, I'm being distracted, so I apologize for that. All right. Uh, let's go with Alex Wilkins. Alex Wilkins, how do I become a better leader in my service-based business? Um, I have been doing design landscaping. Uh, they do custom curbing, trim, retaining walls, not mowing. It requires more skill than more normal landscaping work. I'm training people and leaving them up enough to trust them when I can live, build several teams and get to know work, getting stuff sufficiently. Sorry, I'm, I can't read this. Uh, for customers, and we take on, we take care of the equipment. I have a very high standards, both in skill and effort, and I feel my team doesn't care like I do and doesn't work as hard as I do. How can I get them to level up and do better? Okay, got it. I find the one to two people who can make the team leaders and grow the business. It is very mentally tough for you. Yes, okay, I got it. Alex, I'm getting exactly what you're saying. So your question here is that how do you how do you start trusting a team and how do you get them to want to do the, the work and uh, be as passionate as you are for your own business? And then how do you identify your next leaders so that they can start delegating? So that's what I understood. So this is a reality. Nobody's gonna give a shit as much as you do about your company. I'm sorry. That's, that's just the way it is. You own your company, you started your company, you put the risk in your company. Nobody will ever be as passionate as you are about your company because that's the reality of entrepreneurship. What we do as entrepreneurs is we sell a vision. There's a reason people take a pay cut and they come and work for us and they, they have less opportunity, less benefits, less things they do if they go out and get a real job at a corporate place, right? So these are people that are choosing to be with us. And our job as their leaders is to sell the vision, to sell them why we're doing this and be part of something bigger. They can have a bigger upside. They can have a bigger way. So the first fact is, you mentioned it twice, the truth is they will never be as passionate about you are as your company and they will never care as much as you do because you're the owner of the business. Now, how can we get them and bridge them to that is by involving them in our vision, is by making them buy into it and by having them really come into our business and be part of that and having that autonomy and that dependency on doing it, right? So now, the first thing I need, to, I need you to find is people who are great at the job, but that, that's not the number one thing that most people look at. What we wanna look is at behaviors. We wanna understand what are your core values? What do you really value? What are the behaviors that you're expecting your, custom, your, your employees to have? And then I want you to find people with those behaviors and tell them that that's an expectation. I want you to recruit based on your behaviors. I want you to onboard and create in, 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 in with your behaviors. I want you to create the expectation that you're going to be reviewing these people based on these behaviors. So that's the first thing you need to look at when people, when you're trying to get them to leadership team position is that they live the values and the behaviors you want them to behave. They can be very skillful, but not have your behaviors. Skill you can always teach, but behaviors is hard to get. So number one, behaviors. Number two, skill set. Yes, you need people who are skilled, you're in a technical job, you need people who either want to learn the skill or are good at skilled, right? 
And then if they show the behaviors that they want to do this, then they can level up and, and the skill set. And then number three, they need to produce the results you need them to produce. So as a good leader, we need to have good expectations on behaviors, good expectations on roles and responsibilities and what they're accountable for, and then good expectations on what the deliverables are. What do I expect you to do? And if you do this, it's good. A lot of us, when we have a job, we don't need our boss to tell us if we had a good a good day or a bad day. I know whether I had a good day or a bad day if I hit these metrics. The more expectation setting, the clearer the expectation you have with your team, the easier it is for them to go there and to satisfy those expectations. So having clear expectations, number one. Number two, a leader needs to love people and needs to love and find what's best for their people. There are a lot of technical people out there, developers, accountants, technical work like yours, that are great at doing a job, but they don't like people. They will never make good leaders. One of the biggest mistakes we do is we grab our best performer and we say, now you're gonna manage a team. And the skills to do the thing they do is very different than the skills to manage people. So make sure that you choose someone who loves people and who wants what's best for them. So number one, they need to have the behaviors, they need to have the skill set, and they need to have the great expectations of hitting those numbers. And then number two, they need to want and like people and want what's best for them. All right, so that's that's that. Um, Alex, develop yourself, get to understand what are the behaviors you're expecting from everybody, what are the tools and accountabilities that you want them to, to go through, and then that way you can get them to that level. Now, I usually talk to them And if I see somebody with potential, I'll tell them, hey, I need you to deliver this, this, and this, and this, and then you'll get that position, then you'll get there, and they need to prove to me that they're gonna be good leaders so that I can then uh, develop them as leaders and and have them be in charge of the team. I hope this is helpful, Alex, and that's it. We got these questions right here. Hope this was helpful, and see you soon.